So we are going deep straight into the program for this morning, starting with the first panel on higher education agency and inequalities, perspectives on the pandemic, which will be chaired by Profumi Olo Nistakin. Did I manage? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, she will be chairing the panel uh, of, of three. And uh, without much ado, Prof, you want to take over. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. Thank you. Good morning. Excellent. Following yesterday's amazing uh, introduction and amazing discussion uh, across the panels, I think we are continuing this morning seamlessly. And it's a real privilege uh, to have, uh, to be chairing such an eminent panel here this morning. Um, and we will show you how it's done. We will start now and finish promptly at 10.30 so that the program doesn't drag. And I can tell you these are seasoned um, scholars who will uh, lead the way in that respect. The topic of today, which is higher education agency and inequalities, of course, perspectives uh, on, the pa on pandemics, uh, begins to bring higher education right to the core uh, of the matter. And um, in the panel, in one of the panels we had yesterday, we saw the description of how governments retreated behind the borders. We saw how everything stopped and how Africa seemed to be at the mercy of global actors. But actually, the reality on, in Africa is that Africa did approve its resilience. But the area of higher education is where you saw collaboration amongst researchers across the board. There were no borders in that respect. But this is where the question of agency comes in. And, and the questions we'll be examining this morning have to do with how inequalities manifest even when there's that desire and the natural uh, inclination to collaborate. We saw how in intellectual property uh, became politicized in particular ways. But at the same time, we saw how we learned differently from global classrooms. But the question of who owns Africa's data? Where is Africa's capacity to generate its own knowledge without the kinds of interventions that have not been available to Africa. And the question of the experience during COVID uh, is one uh, that we need to take on board. I'll ask my panelists to speak for 15 minutes maximum. I will give you an indication when it's two minutes to the end of that 15 minutes. Uh, and then I'll pass on to the next panelist. Um, as you have on the program, our first speaker is Jomo Kwame Sondaram. And I would pass on to you now. Please uh, welcome our colleague. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Let me emphasize how important it is to remind ourselves not to take peace for granted, especially in our very difficult times when many powers are finding the slightest pretext for going to war. And many economies are driven by the imperative of warfare. This is something to be taken very, very seriously. And I hope that we will think about it as we reflect on the difficulties which we face in our times. I have uh, dedicated this uh, to our late, uh, to three people who have passed away, who are very important in the development of Codestria and who shared many of the concerns which I'm going to speak about today. Most importantly, I think uh, the, late, the late Tandika Makwan, Makandavire um, passed away, as you all know, uh, and on uh, in in uh, the first half of the COVID, uh, first half of the first year of the COVID period. And uh, it's appropriate that this session is dealing with the challenges of the pandemic. But let me quickly move on to remind ourselves of the difficulties which we face in the world. I think the first important difficulty is to recognize that the inequalities in this world are rarely at the national level. The greatest inequalities, as great as the national level inequalities are, are actually international. And, the, and Branko Milanovic uh, has basically shown this very well, where more than two thirds of overall income inequalities in the world 
are actually at the national level rather than at, sorry, at, at the international level rather than at the national level. This is important for us to try to think about because we are often very, very preoccupied and correctly so with national level inequalities. But we also have to pay attention to international inequalities. We need also to think very seriously about imperialism. I think the period, the recent period has jolted many people who previously had forgotten about imperialism, who forgotten about neocolonialism and so on, to begin to think about this. And it's very important to recognize that the strongest and earliest re uh, re responses to imperialism actually came from the global south. People like Said Jamaluddin al-Afghani, for example, or uh, Dadabai Nauruji in India, uh, talked about imperialism in the middle of the 19th century of the Christian era. English liberals were a bit later. The transition from John Stuart Mill, for example, to John Hobson, uh, Vladimir Ilyich in Russia, and more recently, I think the most important recent work on imperialism, of course, is from the Patnaiks, Utsa and Prabhat Patnaik uh, in, in uh, India. Now, it's important for us to think about the 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 period since imper since colonialism as a period partly of what Kwame Nkrumah quite correctly identified as neocolonialism, but also as involving a variety of post-colonial mixes, which uh, the, the 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 late uh, Polish economist uh, Kalecki, Michal Kalecki, referred to as intermediate regimes involving mixes. Mixes which we are, which we have to begin to deal with. So when we think about development strategies, we need to think about development strategies within this kind of context. Now, much of the recent period, of course, has been dominated by a particular view of the world, which came from Washington, a view which was shared not only by the U.S. Treasury Department, but also very importantly by the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF, and the World Bank. But let us remember that they, although they are called the Bretton Woods institutions, the Bretton Woods system no longer exists. In August 19, uh, 1971, uh, Richard Nixon pulled out of the Bretton Woods system and it no longer exists. And we, what we basically need to understand is how the system operates today. Now, I don't have the time to get, get into it all right now, but I think it's useful for us to begin to re reflect on how the Washington consensus as it is articulated from Washington is actually quite different from the stark realities which existed, for example, in Latin America, which lost one decade, and Sub-Saharan Africa, which lost, in my view, possibly up to a quarter of a century, from the late 1970s right to the beginning of this century. So we have seen a devastation, but the discussion of this Washington consensus does not include much serious consideration of what happened in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's important for us, I, in my view, for us to think very, very seriously about what it implies and contrast it with the Latin American experience and the East Asian experience. I've just been reminded by the chair that we have less time than I had prepared for, so I'm going to skip over many of the phenomena which has characterized the Washington consensus period. But I think it's important for us to recognize that this has been key. and also undermine very importantly what we used to call food security. Food security has been defined very, very differently uh, in the more recent period. Um, and, and basically what we have as a consequence is the undermining of national sovereignty in a very profound way. So what we have also seen is the neglect, the, the neglect of productive investments and a greater emphasis on financial investments the financial flows have got very little to do with the with the development of real or productive investments. But this is, of course, something which evades Washington. And what we have seen in the more recent period with the transition to the unipolar world, which our executive secretary Godwin uh, referred to yesterday, what we have seen is the transition in that transition is a ignoring of the fact that, in a sense, we have 
uh, a, trans a transformation of, of, of a very um, important discourse which has favored uh, the world of finance in very important ways. And that has had devastating consequences in my view for Africa, which I will try to mention uh, in, in a little while. So all this has had a very important consequence in terms of justifying the kinds of inequalities which we have in the world. And that in, those inequalities have, have basically affected um, uh, growth and has also undermined the capacity to reduce inequalities and to cut poverty. Now, let me quickly remind you of what trade liberalization has actually involved as far as the world is concerned. We have seen, for example, uh, a recognition at least 70 years ago, if not more, of people like uh, Hans Singer and Raoul Prebisch talking about the unfair terms of trade between primary commodities, both agricultural as well as mineral, and manufacturers. This the decline in that terms of trade has basically continued, as I'll try to show you in a, in a, in a, in a graph later. Similarly, we have seen uh, what Arthur Lewis, uh, who worked, as many of you know, on Ghana for, for a period of his life, um, basically argued was a decline of the terms of trade for tropical agricultural products compared to temperate agricultural products. And the third kind of change, which I, I think has not been sufficiently recognized, is that since the late 1980s, um, we have seen a decline in the terms of trade for manufactured goods produced from the South uh, compared to uh, manufactured goods produced in the North. And again, uh, I would refer, here I would refer you to the work of Maria Angela Parra, uh, which is not very particularly well known, but is very important uh, because to understand the recent period. I also want to emphasize that the high priest of, uh, of trade liberalization, Jagdish Bhagwati, who rails against everybody else. He himself, uh, 60 years ago, in a very important article on immiserizing growth, recognized that many countries in the global south can actually produce much more, but earn much less. Okay, the fact that you're in in circumstances where your where where your 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 uh, so, sorry the terms of trade are declining against you. So just quickly a couple of 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 graphs. Oops, did somebody help me move change the slide? Okay, this is, is the, the graph I promised you earlier. It basically shows you that in the course of the 20th century, the terms of trade have basically declined, although there were periods when the terms of trade moved in favor of the global south. And also, um, it's important for us to recognize that in the relationships between the south and the north, the manufacturing terms of trade, as I said, um, Angela Para has shown this. I've not been able to produce a graph uh, which shows you what Arthur Lewis showed, but basically all this work which was done up to the middle of the 20th century has basically been extended and brought forward to the present period by the Turkish economist Bilger Erten. Now, moving on very quickly, I think it's useful for us to, to quickly reflect. Sorry, could, could I have the change of slide, please? Oops, okay. So what, what we have seen in, in, in the more recent period, especially uh, since the, the, the end of the 20th century, is greater calls for financial liberalization. How did it affect uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and many other developing countries? We were basically told, contrary, contrary, I want to emphasize, to the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund, which provides in Article 6, for the retention of capital controls, what are loosely called capital controls. What we were told by staff of the IMF, including the managing director, was to open up the capital account. Open up the capital account because by doing so, more capital would flow in than would flow out. What this basically meant, you know, because of, of the theories which are being offered, that you basically had capital would flow from the capital rich countries of the, of the, of the North to the capital poor countries of the South. But what happened? You opened up the capital account and, and more capital flowed out of, of, uh, uh, out of the global South than 
flowed into the global south. So there's a net outflow of capital as a consequence. And we know where that capital went, largely to the global north. And this, of course, has had a very profound implications. So this is like what an economist from my own country uh, pointed out si about 60 years ago. He said, this is like opening a bird cage and expecting more birds to fly in than to fly out. Okay, This is the logic of, of this kind of... of uh, so what we have as a consequence of this is um, the, a low, the, the funds were supposed to be lower, but that didn't happen. And what you had uh, is a profound vulnerability to all kinds of things, including what credit rating agencies call, uh, you know, uh, what designate uh, different countries as greater risk and so on and so forth. So all this has meant that the cost of funding for African countries has been much, much higher Okay, so it costs countries much higher. Now, if you there was recently a report which suggested that the size of debt in the low income countries of the world, okay, yeah, the, as designated by the World Bank, has doubled in the recent period. What does it mean? Why has it doubled in the recent period, just in the last last three years? Has it been because there has been a great deal of borrowing from by by these countries? On the contrary. What, we, what has actually happened is that because the interest rates have been raised initially by the US Federal Reserve Bank and also by the European Central Bank, the consequence is that central interest rates have gone up for everybody and the consequence is that developing countries, especially in, in, in Africa, have had to pay much, much more for their debt. So the poorest countries are the ones which are most adversely affected uh, by this recent development. Now, one of the important um, um, uh, considerations to be to be made here is, of course, the fact that I, I, I skipped over some of the the slides, um, some of the items, points in the slide uh, earlier, um, partly because uh, what what you see is that economies have been growing much much slower because it's much more difficult and expensive to access capital, and um, but at the same time you have Countries uh, and and financial institutions which are very keen in doing in pushing loans. That great economist Robert Marley, better known as Bob Marley to all of you, wrote about this in one of his songs in the 1970s about debt pushers going around the world pushing debt, and that has really had very important consequences in the recent period. So many more developing countries, especially in Africa, have been borrowing not from banks but they've been borrowing through bond markets and other such instruments, which therefore, which there, as a consequence of this, in the event of a debt crisis, as we have seen in Zambia and other countries, in the event of a debt, debt crisis, what you're going to do is find a situation where it's almost impossible to negotiate your way around it because you have a variety of creditors and you're not going to be able to find any kind of agreement uh, among all those creditors. Just remember that just with Latin American debt during the 1980s, it took almost one decade from the time of the beginning of the Latin American debt crisis around 1982 to 1989, when Brady, uh, the Treasury Secretary, negotiated what are now known as the Brady bonds. With Now the present situation is much more dire, the amount of debt is much greater, the number of creditors are much greater, and it's almost impossible to find any kind of resolution in the present circumstances. Now, move, moving on, I think it's useful for us to think very quickly about how what what we have seen in the in the present in the present period. Uh, in the present period, I would put it to you that we have a situation where the policies of the OECD, basically the club of rich countries in the world, and the NATO North American North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization, uh, have an effect of actually exacerbating or worsening the kind of economic situation which we which the world lives in. As a consequence of that, you, have, you, have, you see, for example, uh, policies which are not only contractionary in the sense that they reduce the growth of the world economy, if not actually shrink the world economy, but also as a consequence of that, you have a situation where you have regressive policies. In other words, the distributional effects of those kinds of policies are actually regressive, are going to worsen the inequalities at the national level, which I referred to earlier. So the consequence of all this, of course, is that 
the world has in fact changed. What Godwin Murunga referred to on the first day uh, yesterday uh, about the 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 the, 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 my, the moving away from the unipolar world, we have seen, for example, all the calls for trade liberalisation, which we used to hear 20, 30 years ago. Nobody talks about them. It was the rich countries who first introduced protectionist policies, for example, in response to the global financial crisis of 2008. We have also seen, for example, how uh, various other policies were introduced, which make it very, very difficult now. And now you have new policies where it is possible, where the U.S. government and uh, and many uh, European governments are now choosing who they trade with, who they punish. On, on arbitrary grounds, as we heard yesterday, and so on and so forth. We also see that technology is much more difficult to access, contrary to the promise that, oh, if you move to strengthen intellectual property, it will be much easier to access. So we have a, a profound situation, a perfect storm of the worst possible kind for the global south. And I would argue that, this, that without going into the details of it right now, that, the, that this is particularly acute and serious, particularly for sub-Saharan Africa for a variety of reasons. Now, moving quick, quickly, I think one of the ways to go about it is to begin to think about how to get out of this. And I would favor something which I've called uh, for about, which uh, we, we called for about two decades ago for what we call a global green new deal. Now it has taken on certain uh, popularity in certain parts of, of the West. Uh, Alexander, Alexander uh, Ocasio-Cortez and so on and so forth have popularized it. And the, the New Deal is relatively easy to conceive because many people are familiar with the New Deal. But I would basically argue that the two new elements is to emphasize the green element, although to be fair, even Roosevelt's, one of the centerpieces of Roosevelt's New Deal was the creation of the of the of the Citizens Conservation Corps, which was very uh, uh, green, arguably. Uh, at the same time, it's important for us to begin to think about uh, uh, global transfers uh, from 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 the rich countries to the poor countries, and I'll come to that uh, in a in a moment. But basically, what you need is you cannot leave everything to market forces. You need public investments to induce private investments in order to make these kinds of things possible. You cannot tell one and a half billion people in the world, oh, sorry, because we have a, a, a climate crisis, you are not entitled to have electricity. You're not entitled to have access to modern power. You can't tell, you can't do that. I mean, in this day and age, you have got no... You have got no moral standing to do that, but it's precisely because of that we, we need to emphasize the development of renewables as a very important part. Some of us have also done these calculations to basically show that by doing what was called a big push, in other words, a strong investments of global of, of green investments in the present period, especially for renewables, you will reduce the amount of investments. Uh, needed in the longer term, as as represented by the by the brown uh, versus the green uh, bars in this bar chart. Um, help, please. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Now, just in case any of you had any illusions about uh, counting on the West, uh, Mr. Joseph Borrell, the High Commissioner for, for International Relations for Foreign Affairs, uh, the num in other words, the number two in the European Union, uh, reminds us very happily that you know Europe is a garden, the rest of the world is a jungle, and the jungle will invade the garden. To protect the garden, the gardeners have to go to the jungle. Otherwise, the rest of the world will invade us. Okay, this is online. You can you can go and check it out for yourself if you like. Now, basically, there are many pan pandemic lessons to be drawn. Let me just quickly uh, leave them on the on the uh, and rather than some try to summarize them. But I want to emphasize only one point. Madiba, the late Nelson Mandela, basically uh, called his, his last struggle, Madiba's last struggle was the struggle for the public health exception to the trips to the uh, uh, Trade-Related Intellectual Property Rights Agreement of 
and he succeeded. The Doha round was basically resumed in 2001 after 9-11, precisely on the understanding that the public health exception would go through. But see, look at what happened during the pandemic. There was no willingness to entertain that public health, public health. What can you have which is more serious than a pandemic? Okay, and there was no willingness to do that. All the other uh, arrangements basically could not have not are not likely to succeed. So I will not get into them right now. But I think there's one other thing which many countries need to 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 emphasize, and that is the need for a regular annual issue of special drawing rights. Why is that important? It is important because these rich countries are not going to be more generous. But special drawing rights basically confer upon them financial uh, means, which they don't even need to work for. It's basically free money. okay, And that can be redeployed for, for developmental purposes, for, for to, to fight the climate uh, change, et cetera, et cetera. This is very important. The last point is to emphasize that many of us are handicapped by the fact that for our foreign ministers actually make, make very often make very nice pronouncements, but our finance ministers and our trade ministers do exactly the opposite of what they fight for. As a consequence of this, we don't make enough progress. So as Tandika Makandavire reminded us, we need to continue to run while the others can afford to walk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm very sorry if you felt that I rushed you. I could see a lot of nuggets uh, in your presentation. I let it run for a while. And I, I think it's important to keep in our minds the, the main message, the argument at the start, and the logic of that argument was maintained all the way through, that overall inequalities in the world are more at the international level. And actually, if you did nothing about that international level, we cannot possibly begin to address uh, the, the national level questions. And it's very interesting the points uh, on which you conclude. Actually, you reinforce that by saying the OECD uh, and NATO worsen the situation. So the global institutions that, uh, if you like, undergird and also gatekeep uh, essentially worsen this. The global Green Deal, but uh, it's important the the contradictions you highlight internally uh, between those who are sending the central message and the finance ministers. I look forward to a discussion of that. Without further ado, let me turn to Joy Kwesiga. How would you like to do it? Do you, would you like to go to the podium? Yes, yes, please. Thank you so much. And it's good to see you again. Thank you. Maybe this is too high. Yes. Thank you very much, moderator. Good morning, everybody. Uh, greetings from Uganda, Kavad University. I congratulate Kodesia on reaching 30 years of service. Uh, the previous, uh, my predecessor has set the global scene and my presentation will be looking at maybe regional, national, what happens locally uh, uh, within the context of what we are discussing. The higher education agency inequalities and how we deal with them. So that maybe it can fit more easily into the wider global picture that we have talked about. They are the basics that, that we know. I won't go in details about them because of the shortage of time. And uh, I come from a region where pandemics actually have been taking place many, very often. Uganda, the, uh, along with the borders of DRC, Sudan, and Tanzania, Marburg, Ebola, and then COVID. So we have experience of those areas. But what we have learned is that pandemics, the situations breed 
the new normal that we all know of, and that new normal requires new approaches. But it's difficult because generally there is usually no preparedness. And this is our experience. So you need the resources, you need the uh, many things, but because of it, this is a, a pandemic or epidemic, it is emergency. In the same way as we deal with refugees, you find that you are dealing with saving life, getting shelter and all those, but you forget others because you are saving situations. And that's how I see inequalities coming in and getting more emphasized as we put this in the context of epidemics and pandemics. And COVID-19 a is a very good example to that. So in relation to higher education, the, the, the question is, is the higher education able to offer alternative ways of handling pandemics and building capacities and dealing with the agency? And my view that I want to emphasize one issue because higher education is not really taken as a right within our situations, within our systems. It may be in the books, it may be in the constitution, but in actual reality, how it is practiced, it is not taken as a right as such. And with regard to the resources that are given to higher education sector, so if the resources are not available, then this is how higher education will, will respond equally to pandemics and inequalities. So uh, because of that, you'll find that it's not so easy for higher education to make this great contribution that we should be making. I'll be using the COVID-19 pandemic to explain many of these things because my our experience in Uganda, we had the longest lockdown of institutions. We were told in the whole world, <laughs> many months we were locked down and this experience can give others what happened and how we can actually tackle issues of inequalities. The challenges which came about was how to keep the learners without dropping out of the system. If you spend almost two years without proper education in the normal sense. And what was the immediate uh, solution seemed to be distance learning, online learning. And I'm going to be talking about that a lot of the time, most of the time, because this is how in the region we focused on that issue, on order as, as it were. But in my own institution of Kabul University, the order was homemade. We, we had to sit and make our own system of how to deal with the e-learning as it were. But we are not sure, should it be a full-time thing? How are we going to plan when we ever get the institutions open? And so we had to prepare the learners, we had to prepare the teachers, we had to prepare, prepare the institution all over. So we had to do a survey among students, among staff, who owns, uh, for instance, a smartphone, who owns a laptop, all those things at a distance when you are locked down, sometimes through social media, through WhatsApp, utilizing all those levels. But we found that about 20% could not be catered for, which is already a source of inequality. And we had to see what to do with them later on when we open up so that we have programs that we will deal with, help those people to come up to the level of those who are able to be online learning. And we had to prepare in such a way that we get all the students able to use the kind of equipment we have. For instance, 
students of engineering or architecture would require different types of input. So we're looking at uh, is internet affordable? These are basic things, but they are very important. Is it available? And I wish to emphasize I'm talking from a rural-based university, not in the urban areas. So this is where there are many deprivations and I'm talking from that perspective. Is there stable power? Where I live, we celebrate when we spend a week without power interruptions. So how do you give a service when power is off, on and off all the time? You need to prepare for that so that you can put things in place. So all these questions on quality assurance about security, you had to answer and prepare for. And um, so I'd like now to move to the interplay between inequalities, exclusion, and agency in higher education because they sort of overlap and they affect each other. It is through responding to these questions that I have talked about that we are able to see, in my view, how these inequalities and the ex exclusions manifest. First, this is for emphasis, we have learners who are resource poor. They have been drop out of higher education even without any epidemic. They do. Each, each year we get big numbers of students, not just my institution, I'm talking from the Ugandan perspective, from many universities who drop out because they cannot pay the fees they expected to pay within a year. They can drop out within the first semester. So that is one group. We have another group which because they are rural, they are not as exposed as the urban students and also in terms of computer skills. So even if you do on learning, they are not able to catch up in the same way as the people who have used the computers through their nursery or primary school level. That's very important. And also it, this exposure to general technology. We already know about girls, which are already not so much at the level with the boys, although they may be these days in terms of numbers, but there's still other social domestic issues that impede their progress. There are people with disability, and this was a, a very great lesson in the areas of uh, um, accessibility and equity because you still need to to pay special attention to the people with disability, the visually impaired, the, the, the deaf, all those, you, are, you needed to take account of that. What do you do for them if you just go online? Because I'm using the online example. We have minorities who went back to, to their homes for example, in, in Uganda, we have the people they call the Batwa, colonialists called them the pygmies. They, they have been displaced in, from the forest, their habitat, and they can't fit properly in the schooling system. And once they go off in such situations, you need to have something in place for them to do. These forces of exclusion therefore need to be carefully attended to in terms of times of pandemic, where focus is on the most urgent rather than uh, emphasizing leaving no one behind. So just uh, quickly examples of the prerequisites for for equal opportunities, which will lead to good practice and maybe it will help us to catch up as we go uh, uh, global. Our experience, this is the lesson word, we needed a needs assessment. I've mentioned that, referred to that before, but majorly we also needed training of staff 
and students, not just training once, but retraining and retraining each semester so that you are able to, to keep people up to the level where they can get useful learning and, and, and teaching. Adequate internet I've already referred to, but is a prerequisite. But the major one is policy guidelines. This was a pandemic and uh, many institutions were not prepared in terms of policy. How do you do this distance learning? Do you have the guidelines, all those things? Quality framework and able to tap all the loopholes. So I'll, I'll just move on to give you examples of innovations of how we tackled the, the issue of inequality at a national and institutional level. The first one at the institutional level, you, we had to save specifically put money aside to have good computers. Remember, majority, not majority, but quite a number of students don't have good gadgets or good computers. So you have to have a good laboratory with uh, high-end high computers in order to, to cater for them, they can use that one. The human resource to train the staff and train the people, recruitment, retraining of technical people, that was the issue. I mentioned that the, the e-learning uh, version we had was domestic. We made it homemade within the university. So we needed that kind of group reinforced. And we had to pay more money in terms of strengthening our power. As I said, we are in, in different areas, solar, we tap solar, we also use uh, generators in order to keep online. So those were the inputs that we had, but we also had to spend more money on e-libraries because these are very important. And our e-libraries, to make sure that this e-library is accessible, whichever part of the world you are when you are a student of this institution. And then we had to deal with a special laboratory to be able to do videos so that we can send it to teachers and be able to move. So that was one intervention of spending money, improving the structure of e-learning, but is underlined by frequent surveys and monitoring. So the, the second intervention that the, or, uh, I would like to emphasize is how we deal with, with people with, with, with disability. We had to get the right kind of computers, which open as a, what they call jobs or job access with speech, so that the the the, the people who are visually impaired can can use these ones in the library. We had to get Victor readers in order to access information for these people so that they can actually get information and be able to interpret it themselves. We had to get more books, more literature in Braille. We had to get the right kind of scanners with embossers which are able to help the visually impaired and related headsets. These are simple equipment, but you needed to have prepared for them in order to be inclusive and to reduce inequality. And, and we had therefore to do all that in order to have this blended learning that will help in terms of such Epidem epidemics, but in particular, that was the result of COVID-19. Then the second, the third area that I want to give an example is an innovative project that in my university, Kabul University, we termed blended learning solution to advance gender equity in education in Uganda. This is was a specific 
uh, intervention targeting teachers, primary school teachers, because our government put out a policy by that uh, by 2029, every teacher must have a degree qualification. And primary school teachers are the lowest paid in, in my country, but also they're usually young mothers who cannot move to different areas for study and, and they, need, uh, they needed attention. They also teach full time, so they on, can only study during school holidays. So we patterned with the Canadian uh, Mass Communication Organization. We patterned with the national NGOs that focus on, on women's education. We patterned with the, the local people, what we call local leaders in the community in different districts of Uganda. And we came up with a pilot study which enables the, the teachers to remain where they are because of the things that we gave them. So that they can study. So I just need to describe what happened in this in this project very briefly, how the project worked. The project provide, provides opportunities to female and some male students, male teachers, to study their bachelor of education degrees at a pace they can self-manage without coming to the university. Electronic gadgets called MP4 players and solar chargers are reloaded with education lectures and videos and given to female teachers from rural areas to, for self-learning. All the content is available offline in offline format, not always requiring internet connectivity so that they can work for credits. But we had centers to, okay, centers to help them move on. And this has helped, it is a pilot project, but so far it has helped over almost 120 teachers to move. We expect that in the next year, some of them will get their degrees. But I won't go into the details of how they, they, they study, but eventually they come to the university. So this is how we moved. So as I conclude, I have a few remarks to point out, which is a lesson that uh, many of the lessons that we learned, but in summary, pandemics are prone to widening exclusion and enhancing inequalities and undermining agency. So we need to study this uh, carefully. Uh, there is need for disaster preparedness of sorts. We must have good, good institutions, whether national level or at institutional level. We have to have disaster preparedness in, in a policy and some preparedness of some sort. This is especially so because the interventions in epidemics are actually urgent. So that we don't now deprive people following what they call the Matthew factor, those who have will have more. So although this is really focusing on, on higher education, I just wanted to make a call to Codesia as we move on because higher education draws from the poor of secondary schools or, or basic schools in the region. We all know the I hope we all know the experiences, the many, many thousands of girls who either dropped out of school or are being helped to go back to school after becoming young mothers because of, of, of COVID. So we need to look at that area too, as we, we support our research at Codestria. This is uh, my suggestion. It is possible to minimize inequalities and to build capacities of those affected and supporting teams only 
if we become aware of the problem. Hence, the very much survey, the needed surveys that we must continue with. We do wish to use the term eradication, but we can't use the term eradication of inequalities at the moment because there are still many problems. Thank you very much. This is my experience of the higher education inequalities in the pandemic context. Thank you. So very much. Uh, you've seen how we've moved from uh, the global uh, uh, level and the, uh, we're seeing some of the manifestations of those global in inequalities in, very, in a very uh, local and national context. And in fact, uh, the point on which you concluded, as you mentioned your conclusion about how pandemics are prone to widening exclusion, but we could see from your example and your experience how actually as a result of the pandemic, you took steps to begin to, uh, to, to reduce those inequalities. And the real lessons, I think, for higher education institutions uh, to learn from that. If from my context, uh, global partnerships sometimes do not necessarily help, but actually the partnerships within the country and between countries in Africa that actually strengthen or at least reduce those gaps. Thank you. Um, last but certainly not least, uh, I would go to M Mukendi Andre. Thank you so much. Merci, Madame la modératrice, de m'accorder la parole. Je voudrais commencer par remercier le Codesria pour l'opportunité qu'il me donne afin que je puisse présenter la petite réflexion que nous avons menée sur la pandémie de COVID-19 à Kinshasa. Et comme vous le savez, euh, à partir du programme qu'on a donné, notre texte est intitulé « Riposte contre la COVID-19, pauvreté et inégalité sociale à Kinshasa, contribution à la problématique de l'écart. » Alors, lorsque... La pandémie a éclaté et lorsqu'elle a commencé à se répandre à travers le monde, la grande crainte qui était éprouvée, c'est de voir l'Afrique être devant une catastrophe sanitaire, étant donné que l'Afrique ne disposait pas de suffisamment d'infrastructures et d'équipements pour faire face à ce fléau mondial. C'est ainsi que bon, l'OMS a arrêté certaines mesures et l'a diffusé à travers le monde à l'intention des différents gouvernements. Et ce sont ces mesures-là que les différents gouvernements ont appliquées dans leurs euh, pays respectifs. Alors, nous avons commencé à observer l'obéissance à ces mesures qui ont été édictées par les autorités gouvernementales. Et nous avons constaté que, dans une partie, la partie est de la ville de Kinshasa, la population semblait ne pas vouloir respecter ces normes-là. Elle résistait face à ces normes sanitaires édictées par les autorités gouvernementales. Et donc, nous nous sommes saisis de cette délinquance sanitaire 
pour essayer de comprendre ces déterminants. Et face à la question de la délinquance, on peut évoquer des, des déterminants politiques, des déterminants culturels, mais nous avons voulu retenir ce qu'il y a de spécifique pour cette partie est de la ville de Kinshasa, et c'est la pauvreté. Et donc, nous avons voulu comprendre comment la pauvreté avait produit la délinquance sanitaire lorsqu'il fallait appliquer les mesures anti-Covid-19. Et sur le plan théorique, nous avons inscrit euh, cette réflexion dans ce que nous appelons la problématique de l'écart. Notre présentation va prendre quatre petits points. Nous avons d'abord le, le cadre théorique de l'étude, c'est-à-dire la problématique de l'écart. Ensuite, nous allons parler de la géographie de la pauvreté et de la pandémie de COVID-19 dans la ville de Kinshasa. Au troisième point, nous allons voir l'action publique qui a été menée contre la COVID-19 et comment cette action n'a pas tenu compte des inégalités sociales dans la ville de Kinshasa. Et enfin, nous allons parler de la production de la délinquance sanitaire par la pauvreté. Alors, en ce qui concerne le cadre théorique, c'est la problématique de l'écart. En sociologie, les études sur la désobéissance aux normes sont regroupées dans, sous le label de ce qu'on appelle les gap studies, qu'on traduit en français par la problématique de l'écart. Alors, cette problématique de l'écart constitue le deuxième versant de la sociologie du droit, qui est consacré à l'application des normes, alors que le premier versant est consacré à la production sociale du droit dans la société. Alors, cette problématique de l'écart se décline sous trois approches. Il y a une approche juridique ou normative, il y a une approche économique et une approche sociologique. L'approche juridique, qu'on appelle aussi les théories de, de lacunes, insiste d'abord sur la nécessité d'adapter le droit à l'évolution de la société, au contexte social. Et ensuite, ces théories de lacunes s'intéressent à l'incomplétude de l'ordre juridique. C'est ainsi que l'on parle des lacunes positives, d'une lacune positive qui est définie en, en termes de la plasticité de, de la règle au regard de l'évolution sociale et des lacunes négatives en termes d'insuffisance normative. Alors que la lacune positive donne lieu à la jurisprudence, la lacune négative fait appel au législateur. La deuxième approche, c'est l'approche économique ou la théorie de l'efficacité ou de l'inefficacité du droit. Selon cette approche économique, la validité du droit est appréciée en fonction des résultats que produit le droit. Cette conception instrumentale de la norme juridique est mise en concurrence avec d'autres normativités. Donc, on met le droit produit par l'État en concurrence avec d'autres normativités qui participent à la régulation sociale. L'inefficacité des normes est donc évaluée selon deux paramètres, les objectifs non réalisés, mais aussi ce qu'on appelle en sociologie les effets émergents ou les effets pervers. Et enfin, nous avons la troisième approche, c'est l'approche sociologique. C'est la théorie de l'effectivité ou de l'ineffectivité des normes. Pour la sociologie, le droit doit être vivant, 
C'est-à-dire le droit doit se traduire dans les faits, dans les comportements. Sinon, le droit, c'est un droit mort. Et c'est là que nous nous situons, étant donné que nous sommes sociologues. Et donc, la question de l'effectivité se définit d'une part par les comportements des individus, mais aussi par l'application des sanctions face à la déviance sociale. Alors, dans cette étude, la question des lacunes du droit a été posée dans la mesure où l'universalité des normes ou du dispositif normatif n'a pas tenu compte des illégalités et des conditions de pauvreté de certaines catégories sociales. La question de l'ineffectivité, c'est-à-dire la dimension sociologique de ces normes sanitaires, est d'ailleurs notre point focal, car nous voulons expliquer la délinquance sanitaire par la pauvreté. La question de l'efficacité ou inefficacité des normes sanitaires, la dimension économique, n'a pas beaucoup été évoquée ou a été évoquée seulement à travers quels effets pervers liés à l'application des normes sanitaires qui étaient imposées par les autorités politiques. Le deuxième point porte sur la géographie de la pauvreté et de la pandémie de la COVID à Kinshasa. La ville de Kinshasa est subdivisée en quatre grandes parties, en partant de l'ouest vers l'est. Nous avons la première partie, qu'on appelle « district », qui était une ancienne subdivision administrative des provinces, mais aujourd'hui, ça n'existe pas, mais ces entités sont restées comme telles parce qu'elles constituent la circonscription électorale pour les, les, les élections législatives dans la ville de Kinshasa. Donc, nous avons le Kunga à l'ouest et une partie du nord. Au centre, nous avons Funa, nous avons Moamba et nous avons la Tchangu à l'est. Tchangu, c'est le champ de notre étude, c'est-à-dire à, à l'extrême est de la ville de Kinshasa. Alors, dans cette géographie de la pauvreté à Kinshasa, nous avons constaté que lorsqu'on part de l'ouest vers l'est, la pauvreté s'intensifie. Il y a une forte incidence de la pauvreté. Et nous avons des chiffres donnés par l'école de santé publique de Kinshasa. Lukunga, l'incidence de la pauvreté, c'est-à-dire les gens qui consomment moins de 1,25$ par jour. Lukunga, c'est 67,4. Funa, qui vient ensuite, c'est 70,2, 70,2. Moamba, c'est 77 ou 77,7. Et la Tchangou, c'est 90,3%. Donc, la pauvreté, c'est effectivement à Tchangou. Alors, après avoir vu cette géographie de, de la pauvreté, qui se situe à l'extrême est de la ville, nous avons fait aussi une géographie de la prévalence de la pandémie. Et là, nous voyons un rapport inversé. Parce que, en partant de l'ouest à l'est, on voit que le taux de prévalence est en train de baisser. Alors qu'avec la géographie de la pauvreté, c'est l'inverse. Là, on voyait la pauvreté qui augmentait. Et donc, on a vu que le taux de prévalence et le taux de pauvreté étaient en rapport inverse. Alors, la conséquence de, de cette non-coïncidence entre la pauvreté et la pandémie, c'est que les gens qui habitent Chang, pour eux, la pandémie, ce n'était pas leur maladie, c'était la maladie des riches. Parce que c'est là où, c'est dans la partie riche, où il y a plus de prévalence de COVID-19. Alors que chez eux, le taux est extrêmement faible. 
Et cela va donc euh, créer cet imaginaire selon, laquelle, selon lequel la pandémie de COVID-19, c'est une maladie des riches, ou à la limite, une maladie des blancs, et non pas une maladie des pauvres. Et cela va déterminer le comportement de ses habitants de Tchangou. Troisième point, action publique des ripostes et inégalités sociales. La politique anti-Covid-19 en RDC était définie à travers deux ordonnances présidentielles du président de la République et un décret du Premier ministre. Et pour la ville de Kinshasa, on a ajouté l'arrêté du gouverneur de la ville, qui avait aussi pris certaines mesures pratiques pour lutter contre cette pandémie. Et parmi ces mesures, il y a des mesures qui sont connues par tout le monde, la restriction d'entrée et de sortie au niveau des frontières, l'inexistence, pardon, l'exigence d'un contrôle négatif aux tests de COVID pour tout déplacement interne et externe, la distanciation physique des personnes en milieu public, le port obligatoire des masques, ainsi de suite. Alors, la gestion de cette riposte était confiée à un comité multisectoriel national avec un secrétariat technique. Et pour une fois, on a vu que ce secrétariat technique, dirigé par un chercheur de Renault, le professeur Mouyembe, qui a été d'ailleurs décoré il y a quelques mois ici au Sénégal par le président Macky Sall pour ses recherches en épidémiologie. Et donc, on a vu cette fois-là que les scientifiques, au moins, étaient pris en compte, étaient consultés pour faire face à cette pandémie. Et donc, ce comité-là était organisé du niveau national jusqu'au niveau le plus réduit du système sanitaire, c'est-à-dire la zone de santé. Et comme axe stratégique, ce comité multisectoriel visait à renforcer les capacités de diagnostic de laboratoire et de recherche, à renforcer la capacité de surveillance et d'investigation des cas, à améliorer la prise en charge intégrée et l'engagement communautaire, à renforcer le système logistique d'urgence du COVID-19, à assurer la prise en charge psychosociale, à mettre en œuvre des mesures de mitigation des risques de propagation de la pandémie. Alors, ces mesures préventives contre la COVID-19 n'avaient pas affecté la population de Kinshasa de manière homogène. Il y a ceux qui étaient plus affectés que d'autres. Et ceux qui étaient plus affectés, c'était justement les pauvres. Et à titre d'exemple, la privation de la liberté d'aller et de venir était une condamnation à la fin de cette population de la, de, de la partie qu'on appelle, qu appelle le Tchangou à Kinshasa. Parce que dans cette partie, il y a ce qu'on appelle l'économie de la débrouille, c'est-à-dire l'économie informelle, pas seulement, mais toutes les manipulations, toute la mafia, toute la corruption, c'est concentré dans ces milieux-là. Et ces gens-là vivent du jour au jour. Ils doivent sortir tous les jours pour aller chercher quelque chose pour acheter à manger. Et quand vous leur interdisez de sortir, mais vous les condamnez à la famine. Alors que d'autres qui ont plus de moyens peuvent avoir des provisions pour vivre même pendant un mois. Mais dans cette partie-là, il était difficile de survivre. La fermeture des restaurants, par exemple. À Kinshasa, il y a des petits restaurants éparpillés au bord de la rue, partout où il y a des chantiers où les mamans, les femmes, vendent à manger la nourriture. Et quand on a fermé les restaurants, mais ces femmes-là étaient ruinées. D'après une étude menée à Kinshasa, ces femmes avaient un capital mo moyen de 67 dollars. Et quand vous restez une semaine sans sortir, mais vous engloutissez tout le capital. Et donc ces mamans-là étaient appauvries à cause de ces mesures euh, sanitaires. 
le port obligatoire des masques. Au moment où la pandémie commence, ce sont les masques chinois qu'on vendait dans la rue. Et ce, un masque coûtait l'équivalent de 1,25 dollars. Donc, c'est que le moins pauvre ne peut même pas consommer par jour. Heureusement, pour cette question des masques, une parade a été trouvée parce qu'on a vu des gens commencer à confectionner eux-mêmes leurs masques. Il suffisait d'avoir un morceau de tissu et à chercher une élastique et fabriquer le masque. Là, au moins, on a trouvé une issue à ce problème-là. Donc, les populations démunies étaient plus affectées que les autres. Nous avons aussi observé les fonds alloués. C'est le gouvernement a engagé des fonds pour combattre cette pandémie. Et nous avons constaté que la partie qu'on appelle Tchangou, la partie pauvre, qui compte 29% de la population de la ville de Kinshasa, d'après les données de l'Institut national des statistiques, 29%. Mais quand on voit les fonds qui ont été affectés pour lutter contre la COVID, qu'on a donné au centre de santé, c'est 4,8 Et donc, il y avait une égalité sociale. Ceux qui sont plus nombreux ont eu moins de moyens que les autres pour combattre la pandémie. Alors, prenant conscience de ces inégalités, Le gouvernement a pris quand même quelques mesures pour euh, atténuer la pauvreté, notamment la gratuité de l'eau, de l'électricité. Et On a interdit aux, aux bailleurs de mettre à la porte les, 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 les locataires qui étaient insolvents. Alors, production euh, de la délinquance sanitaire par la pauvreté à Tchangou. Rapidement, parce qu'il me reste euh, deux minutes. Je voulais d'abord parler des représentations sociales de la maladie. Parce que les représentations sociales déterminent notre comportement. La population de Tchangou croyait que y a, y a, elle n'était pas tellement vulnérable à la maladie. Et cela était lié à quoi Nous avons mené une enquête et on a constaté que 71% des personnes interrogées n'avaient jamais rencontré un cas de COVID dans leur quartier. Donc, ils, a, ils entendaient à la radio, on parlait de COVID, mais 71% n'avaient jamais vu ou rencontré quelqu'un qui souffrait de cette pandémie dans le quartier. Et 56% n'avaient jamais eu connaissance d'un cas de COVID en dehors de leur quartier. Comparativement à, aux autres parties de la ville, c'est à Tchang où la croyance en l'existence de la maladie était la moins élevée. Alors, si 58% de la population pensait que la maladie pouvait affecter tout le monde, 42% étaient convaincus que c'était une maladie des riches. Et selon l'école de santé publique, 38% des personnes à Tchangou craignaient la maladie. Et quand on ne craint pas la maladie, et donc, on n'a pas à se conformer aux normes sanitaires. Alors, de toutes les mesures prises par les autorités, la mesure la moins soutenue par la population, c'était la fermeture des marchés. Et à Tchangou, 74% ou 74% de la population œuvre dans l'économie informelle, le soutien devait être encore plus faible. Ici, donc à Tchangou, 85% de nos enquêtés avaient affirmé que les mesures anti-Covid les empêchaient de gagner de l'argent pour se procurer la nourriture et payer les loyers. Parmi les familles à faible revenu, 76% étaient incapables d'avoir la nourriture et 85%, au bout d'une semaine, n'avaient plus d'argent. Alors, la résistance à ces mesures anti-Covid à Tchangou, a été couronné, je peux dire, par une manifestation publique. Un mouvement social a été organisé par la population contre le gouverneur parce qu'il avait pris des mesures restrictives dans le transport en commun. On devait réduire de moitié le nombre de passagers par bus. Et donc, cela a soulevé 
la population qui a marché avec euh, des slogans anti-gouverneurs de la ville. Alors, en conclusion, je peux dire ceci. Au regard de la problématique de l'écart, c'est-à-dire l'écart entre le droit et la société, parce que le débat théorique qui, qui est soulevé, c'est celui du rapport entre le droit et la société. Alors, cette problématique de l'écart nous dit que l'ineffectivité des normes sanitaires était non seulement tributaire des conditions matérielles de la population de Tchangou, mais aussi de son imaginaire autour de la pandémie. Et cet imaginaire était produit par la non-coïncidence entre la géographie de la maladie et celle de la pauvreté. Et enfin, les normes sanitaires étaient lacunaires faute d'un ajustement à la diversité des conditions de vie de la population en dépit des mesures palliatives prises par le gouvernement. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so very much. I uh, I think we have heard, I, and I really am sorry that I seem to put pressure on, on the panel uh, to to run through their presentations quickly. Very rich um, uh, data, very rich details of the experience of the pandemic from so many perspectives, from the a global perspective, from uh, a local stroke national, but very uh, local university context uh, and in relation to the rest of the country. And we've just heard very detailed, very rich uh, data coming from the city of Kinshasa. I'm pleased to say that we were given more time for discussion. At the moment, I would have been wrapping up and just thanking everybody for coming. That would not have been uh, ideal. But we have a few more minutes uh, for discussion and I'd like to see uh, a show of hands uh, in terms of I see one person to my right, so I will go from right to, to left intermittently uh, over there. On the, and I'm going to collect as many questions as I can and ask my panelists, uh, just here, if you have the mic, please. So uh, please keep the hand up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm not taking any more, and 10, uh, the last guy. One to 10, I'm not taking any more round of questions. We will listen, and my suggestion to the panel is please respond to the ones that, um, that you feel connect to you the most. And of course, we can have a conversation uh, during coffee break as well. So one, two, three here. Please very briefly, please. Okay. How many questions do you have? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Number two, just right in front of you. Yeah. 
Can I just say, before you uh, go ahead, can we keep the questions really short and comments? I can assure you not all of them will be answered in the time that we have, but I want to give a rich you know, set of options to our panelists. Thank you. les déplacements et les possibilités offertes dans ce domaine. Donc, c'est tout état tout à fait évident qu'on pense que dans les grandes villes, l'épidémie se concentre. C'est mon premier commentaire. Le deuxième, c'est vrai qu'aujourd'hui, il y a une grande littérature hein, en sciences sociales, notamment en entreprise de la santé, sur l'analyse des mesures de santé publique. Et on sait également que les pays africains n'ont pas fait beaucoup d'efforts pour contextualiser les mesures. On n'a fait que répliquer les mesures adoptées en Occident, ce qui a généré ce qu'on appelle les modèles voyageurs, ce qui a généré une faible appropriation sociale. Par exemple, euh, la fermeture des frontières, le confinement dans un contexte de pauvreté, dans un contexte d'économie informelle, sont des mesures inappropriées. Et très tôt, très tôt au Nigeria, on a vu non, le gouvernement a reculé dès qu'ils ont Merci fait le beaucoup. confinement. Okay. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Number four. Thank you. Euh, je suis Aristide Bitouga du Cameroun. Euh, ma question va à l'endroit des deux derniers intervenants. Non, non, mon frère, non. Not you yet, no. Non, mon frère, non. Thank you, Chair. My name is Emmanuel Idaku from the Federal University of Lafia in Nigeria. Now, my question is to the first speaker. A very interesting presentation, sir. Now, I'm drawn to that aspect of capital flights or funds flights. And uh, you gave us the graph that was very explicit. But I want to ask, this argument, does it take into consideration the, the exit of laundered or slushed funds from the political space in Africa? What are the trappings of those laundered funds before, during, and after the pandemic. I ask because that behavior, that act of uh, stealing monies are enablers of what uh, inequality, right? And is a corruption uh, in practice. So how do those funds, if at all, these pieces of yours captured them, how do they affect uh, inequalities as far as COVID is concerned? Thank you very much. Number five is at the back. You know yourself. This, yeah, just at the back. That's right. Uh, 
thank you very much indeed for your interesting uh, presentations. I'm called uh, Furua Warsom. I'm coming from uh, Ghana. Uh, I speak directly to the fourth presenter. We seem to undermine the capacity of the so-called poor segment of society to, so to survive. The poor generally do not comply to lockdowns. They live as if nothing was happening. And the way you present uh, your paper, we have the feeling that it fits more with what was obtained in the West than in Africa. I feel that we need more empirical research, which should be more vigorous and indicate to us our own realities, because the poor never really complied largely Go to Ibadan, go to Kaduna, go everywhere. We live as if there was no COVID. So the way you present the, the poor and how they suffer from COVID, I find it problematic in terms of research. Suddenly, there are more. I need to see more hand. I mean, four hands up here. Yeah? If your hand was not up the last time, please don't put it up. The woman there. Thanks. And I'll go to the, I noticed you the last time, brother, I'm coming to you. Thanks. Try again. It's working, go on. Oh. Not a few questions, my sister. Very briefly, because yes, we're running I'll out of time. Brief. I want to give the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'll be very brief. Thank you. Uh, my first question is addressed to Jomo. Uh, I wanted you to comment on the issue of vaccine manufacturing, because I recall that during COVID, during the pandemic, there was a big issue around uh, with uh, the Western or developed nations arguing that they are not going to permit uh, African and developing other developing regions um, to manufacture their own vac vaccines because they have inter intellectual property rights. Um, so, and, and patents around that. What is your take? How do African countries get around it? Because I'm aware that the African Union actually has got a continental strategy for vaccine manufacturing on the continent. I don't know if you also care to comment about progress on that strategy, implementation of that strategy. Uh, the second issue also is around uh, food security because during the pandemic, largely because of Africa's heavy dependence on imported food, uh, despite the fact that we have land, I mean, it's one of the paradoxes. Uh, so how, you know, what would be your recommendations in terms Thank you. I'm going to take only that one. It's a comprehensive question. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. The brother behind. Thank you. 
Let's go to the middle. The man at the back in the middle. Uh, oh, near middle. Thank you. This one. This one. Ok, merci euh, Adalbert Titia du Cameroun. J'ai une question pour le dernier intervenant. Euh, vous avez terminé votre communication en disant que vous appesantissiez sur le rapport entre le droit et la société. Alors, au bout de l'étude que vous avez menée, êtes-vous en mesure de dire, euh, au regard des résultats de l'étude, si euh, la société a pu vu dans le contexte des inégalités et de la pauvreté, a pu euh, influencer sur le droit tel qu'il a été exercé dans la gestion de la pandémie par les, les politiques publiques. Une dernière question pour le premier intervenant euh, qui nous a vraiment dressé un constat assez cru des inégalités au niveau international. Euh, je voudrais savoir, euh, pensez-vous qu'il faut repenser euh, le modèle de gestion euh, des pandémies au niveau mondial à partir de l'OMS, euh, où on constate que ces inégalités ne sont pas vraiment prises en compte dans la réponse qui est apportée. Merci. Thank you. Why do I have still have more hands up? And I, you know, I think I've done a disservice to that brother at the back. And that's the last question I'm taking. Because someone came before you, I'm so sorry. And I really, really, really am sorry. I can't take more. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Bernard Loutoutala de Kinshasa. Alors, merci, André, pour votre intervention. Je me retrouve en tant que Kinois. Euh, je voudrais poser une petite question concernant les liens avec la pauvreté. Est-ce que c'est la pauvreté en tant que telle qu'il faut épingler ou, euh, comment je dirais, la légitimité du pouvoir Or, À d'autres termes, si on avait un, un gouvernement plus accepté par la population de la Tchango, ce qui n'est pas le cas, est-ce que nous aurions eu les mêmes résultats Et je pense que cette question vaut aussi pour d'autres pays. Est-ce que nos pays, nos gouvernants africains, auraient mieux réussi à faire passer le message s'ils avaient été plus légitimes, plus acceptés par la population? Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to really apologize. I couldn't take more questions. And I'll ask my panelists, because I was given the leeway till 11 o'clock. Please, please, please. And I'm not going to go beyond that. Can you just please selectively respond to the questions? Jomo, I see that you have quite a number of questions. And I, the one of continental free trade uh, is very appealing. And I think that there was a second one as well on vaccine and uh, intellectual property. And I'm sure others can, I mean, those people can come to you at the end of the day. Um, Joy, I think that of brain drain and PhD uh, did you have the same experience in Uganda? That's what I'd like you to respond to. And uh, my brother, I would like you to attend to your countryman from Kinshasa. Is it poverty or governance? You had, someone is taking you on here. Let them see you during the coffee break. Uh, I think that would be good. But there was one that talked about WHO. Is it a policy question, really? Uh, that affects the whole of Africa empirically, we have taken a policy response that doesn't apply to the continent. Please respond, Jomo. Well, thank you very much uh, for your excellent uh, questions. I will be very uh, cryptic in my responses. On the question of trade liberalization, we have to deal with the reality that many of Africa's productive capacities have been undermined by decades of trade liberalization. So you have to begin with what you have now and begin to explore the possibilities thereof. So you, I, it does not, hurt, does not help to, 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 uh, to, to tie your own hands behind your back uh, and to begin by, by trying to build what you, what you don't have. So you, you have to deal with that. And uh, the cut off 
completely from the from the world is also can be very disastrous as Sri Lanka experienced. They ran out of money. They couldn't import uh, fertilizers. They started produce. They started doing organic agriculture overnight, and of course it it failed, and that became disastrous uh, there. So I think it's very important to be very pragmatic in the approach to dealing with this, and that affects also is ACFTA because the ACFTA is 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 does not deal with the realities of of trade relations in the world today and really has to be renegotiated, but it's very difficult to renegotiate uh, trade agreements. Uh, the other question, uh, another question uh, is the whole question of, the, there, are, there are many things which I didn't uh, 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 present, uh, which are in the slides, some for those of you who, who caught the slides. Uh, one important thing which the world learned is, to, is what the slogan which the uh, the former president of the uh, Beijing Plus 10 uh, conference, basically she presented this as an all of government, whole of society approach. So you basically need to have a comprehensive government approach. You cannot have one ministry undermining the other ministry and you cannot have leave everything to the trade ministry alone. Uh, sorry, the health ministry alone. This is some an important lesson which was learned in many, many countries by learning and by doing. And uh, a whole of society approach basically means you need to involve the people in, in, in a way which is persuasive, not coercive. And, and this silly uh, re, uh, thing that, oh, uh, you know, we don't force anybody, everything, uh, people can go ahead. Uh, this is the Western approach, the libertarian approach, and so on and so forth, basically was disastrous. Over oh, many millions of people died unnecessarily in the rich West, uh, unnecessarily, especially in the in the North America. And if you think, you contrast that with what happened in East Asia, where the crisis first began, and contrast that by the low rates of death as well as incidents. So the whole question of mobilizing society is is very important, and this becomes important for us to think about public policies in general, not just the question of the pandemic of the pandemic. Because every crisis, every epidemic is different. You cannot have a one-size-fits-all approach to all epidemics. And this, I think, is a very important lesson which we have, which we heard. Um, if I may, just one other question, because I, uh, it's, it's a very important question. The cap capital flight, if we want, it's crucial to understanding Africa. And last year, uh, Leon uh, Nidhi Kumana, uh, uh, from from uh, I think from Cameroon uh, published a book together with uh, James Boyce, uh, which basically is about capital flight from 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 Africa. It's it's very comprehensive and it includes attempts at estimating laundered money. But laundered money is not the only problem. It's part of the problem, definitely. And we know we need to understand that even the the, the process of laundering has changed. There was a letter in the Financial Times over a decade ago about somebody complaining, stop talking about Switzerland all the time, as if that's the only place where people are hiding their money. They're hiding their money in places like Singapore, in Hong Kong, and so on and so forth. So you need to understand the realities of the world and begin to understand how uh, laws are, are manipulated in order to facilitate laundering. The other questions, I'm very sorry, I cannot, I don't have time to answer. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Please allow me to comment on the, whether governments were doing anything or not. Although you told me to write to focus on one issue, I, I didn't focus on the efforts of government, but definitely in Uganda, this affected it. It overlaps with the question on brain drain because there was a national effort to support the scientists in terms of vaccine, in terms of the collection of data people remained in Uganda. And as a result, they were able to actually develop uh, remedies that helped in the cure uh, of uh, or relief of COVID-19. There, there are medicines on trial and those which were applied at that time. So government was doing a lot of work on that issue. So the brain drain really didn't go be, uh, very far before in particular because of the epidemic or pandemic, brain drain has always happened. So I, I would say that it wasn't so special just because of the pandemic. 
but the support was very, very, very outstanding in that particular case in Uganda. Thank you. Thank you. Je peux dire ceci à, à propos des questions qui m'ont été posées, spécialement à la question du professeur Loutoutara. L'imaginaire que j'ai indiqué tout à l'heure, ce n'est pas l'imaginaire que j'ai produit moi-même, c'est ce que pensent ces gens-là. Donc ça ne m'engage pas. Ce n'est pas moi qui dis que c'est la maladie des riches ou ainsi de suite. Ce sont les gens qui ont refusé de se conformer aux normes qui disent ça. C'est leur point de vue. C'est comme une idéologie. L'idéologie, sa vérité ne réside pas dans sa conformité à la réalité, mais dans son efficacité. Et cet imaginaire a produit des effets. Alors, vous parlez de la légitimité, vous avez tout à fait raison. Et d'ailleurs, si vous lisez mon texte, j'ai évoqué tous ces aspects-là, parce qu'il y a des déterminants culturels, politiques et économiques. Alors, ici, dans le cas spécifique de cette communication, j'ai insisté sur la pauvreté. Mais la légitimité peut aussi euh, être explicatif de la désobéissance aux normes. Mais nous devons être prudents. Ce n'est pas parce que vous êtes légitime que vous allez imposer n'importe quelle norme. Parce que vous savez que la légitimité, ce n'est pas quelque chose de statique. Il y a des légitimations et légitimations. Vous prenez des mesures, même si vous êtes légitime, vous risquez de perdre même la légitimité que vous aviez avant. Et dans ce cas-là, je pense que ce n'est pas tellement la légitimité qui avait poussé ces gens à s'opposer aux normes, c'est plutôt la pauvreté, les conditions matérielles. Parce qu'ils ne savaient pas vivre en se conformant à ces normes-là. C'était difficile de combiner et le respect aux normes sanitaires et de chercher les moyens pour survivre. Donc, la légitimité n'est pas quelque chose de statique. Ça évolue. Vous pouvez être légitime aujourd'hui, demain, vous ne l'êtes pas. Effectivement, cette population est contestataire. Et d'ailleurs, dans ces milieux, il y a ce que les sociologues appellent la contre-culture ou la sous-culture. Dans les milieux pauvres, les gens créent leurs propres normes, leurs propres valeurs. Ça aussi, ça peut expliquer. Mais ici, nous avons plus privilégié une dimension de la pauvreté parce que ça cadre bien avec les thèmes de référence de cette conférence. Merci. I want to really, really, really appreciate the panelists. Um, a depth of thinking, a de depth of analysis. And I want to appreciate my colleagues. I'm sure that some of you are not very happy with me. Not only did I not allow you to answer your questions, but I also didn't allow the panelists to respond to all your questions. I know that's frustrating, but I wanted, I think we can all agree that there was such richness on the panel, from the panel and in the room as well, in terms of the kinds of comments and the questions that you've asked. I want to thank you. And thank you to Kodesra for giving me the extra time to have the discussion, thank you. I think I'm the one standing between you and coffee, but before that, please help me appreciate the panelists deeply. Thank you. Uh, Prof, thank you very much. And thank you very much again on behalf of myself and uh, all of us. We are breaking for tea now. And as you will notice, we are already running behind time. So let's try to be back 30 minutes from now. Uh, and then we'll move to the next panel. So, sorry. Oh, sorry. The tea will be, I, I hope it's served. It's supposed to be served just as you exit the hall. So let's have tea here. Your Excellencies, dear members of the Codestria community, dear friends, happy 50th anniversary. My name is Bård Vegar Soliel, and I'm Director General of NORAD, the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation. Celebrating a golden jubilee is an important milestone. Believe me, I just turned 50 myself some time ago. For half a century, 
Codestria has been a leader in the promotion of high quality research within the social sciences and the humanities on the African continent. Over the years, numerous African scholars have been offered a network, mentoring opportunities, research funding, and possibilities for scientific publication. Many of the beneficiaries of this support have later emerged into prominent scholars. Nourad has supported Codestria on and off since 1986. Last year, we were happy to renew the partnership through the signing of a five-year agreement of core of support. support. The contribution of African scholars is key to achieving the system sustainability goals for ending poverty, stopping climate change, and for fostering democratic values and equality. Knowledge and perspective from, perspectives from African scholars are important for addressing challenges specific to the continent but they are also needed for solving our common global challenges. We in Norway uh, and in Nurad consider Kodesria an important strategic partner. We benefit from discussions with council members and we draw on your knowledge and experiences in our strategic discussions. Personally, I have also find the, found these discussions extremely rewarding among the most insightful discussions about development that I have been part of. We look forward to continuing these discussions and developing the collaboration further in the years to come. But before that, I think you deserve to celebrate and to party. I wish you a successful 16th General Assembly. And again, congratulations on your anniversary. <laughs>